name is Alexander Yaffe, and I work at NASDAQ. It is my job to manage hundreds, thousands actually now, several thousand SQL queries between a page and a page and a half to length. You may think that I have a very horrifying life doing this, <laughs> right? And I did, and I did, until I found this. I found this around uh, four-ish years ago. Well, let's look at what this is doing, right? We're creating an entity of some kind. We're saying, okay, we want to take that thing, we want to filter it, we only care about the Johns in this case, and we only want their ages. All right, let's get their ages. Let's take our test database, and voila, there's our query. That actually happened during compile time. Oh, with change of field, what's happening now? Do you see that? Let's, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so the Quill framework supports all of these culprits and their various personalities. <laughs> um, and they enable significant portability across these things, and we have to support all of them. Uh, of course, Postgres has the biggest feature set of them all, so you can do things with this framework, with Postgres, that you can't really do with anything else. But anyway, I've been working on this framework for, you know, like three, three-ish and a half years. I'm the lead maintainer now, and it's allowed me to actually manage and maintain thousands of SQL queries without wanting to kill myself. And I think that in and of itself is a very large, very large, uh, um, I guess, positive attribute. So, without further ado, let's get into a practical application. This is a practical application of SQL. Right? This, okay, you look at this the first time and you're like, what the? <laughs> right? Like, wait, 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 where, what, right? Here. Okay, okay, code. Where does this code variable come from? Like, what, we, we have two things. We have, we have merchant client that gets matched to a registry, service client that gets matched to two other tables. Where does this come from? This is like the whole cat clawing out thing, where you're, where you're looking, you're like, where, what, how? You're just breaking it in random ways. Right, so the issue with this is that it's, it's, this whole thing is like a giant Rube Goldberg device. Where is it wrong? Where is it breaking? You get this thing in production and you try to figure out what the hell is going on. Well, then you sit down on this thing and you take hours and hours and hours trying to understand it, and then you reduce it in your mind to something like this. You're like, okay, we've got an inner union here below. That inner union has some tables that are being joined on it here. So the first one is being joined, the merchant client to this one table, the service client to two things. And then based on various conditions, we bubble up certain fields to a higher level. Okay, fine. You know, then we look at this other part, we're like, okay, you know, in ETL you see this all the time where data is mapped to other data in complex ways. In this case, clients could be mapped to accounts in multiple ways, right? You can have a certain kind of account that goes to all clients, a certain kind of account that goes to specific clients, a certain kind of account that goes to certain clients based on a tag, which is another field that has no foreign reference key, right? Because that would be a many-to-many -many mapping, but no, they decided not to do that. So we look at this and we're like, let's simplify, right? We are going to simplify. We're going to simplify this thing. We're going to make this bigger, better, or smaller, better, actually. Um, so, okay, here's how we can simplify, right? Let's use some views. Right, so the merchant client and the service, uh, and the, uh, service client, we can take into a separate view, make a view for the union of the two, and voila, here is what we have, right? We take, we take these two, make a union here, and put this into here, right? And then, and then we're all really happy because we've simplified everything and we understand the structure of this query, we understand What's going on? Wonderful, right? We solved the problem. Okay? And then this happens. Right? Right? New requirements. Suddenly we have new businesses that we've acquired and we have a whole new different schema because of course they work differently, right? And so we have a new kind of business that needs to propagate the UIDs differently, and we need to join another table there that has a different market. And then we have another simpler business unit that only has that only has one kind of table that needs to go through that union, right? So uh, let's go. All right. And we're thinking, we're thinking, let's do better. We can do even better, right? We can do, we can have more abstraction power. 
we can, what do we do? We have UDFs, right? We have UDFs because then we can pass this market variable into here, right? And then this thing, this is by the way, our refactored service clients code that we saw before, right? Okay, we can pass this variable in here, so then we can have a union of the UDFs here, right? Well, here's the thing, right? In SQL, you cannot abstract around a join, right? A join cannot be something that's determined by some abstractable entity, which means we need to create a separate UDF for the European service clients, because that thing needs another join, right? So effectively, what have we done by introducing this market variable into here? We have, been, we have done nothing, right? And then on top of that, we still need this giant thing below, because again, you cannot abstract out joins. Right? And so we need this whole thing to be reproduced. Right? Maybe some of this we can pull out into another view, but at best. Here's the one for the Canadians. Right? Okay, so here we actually have reused this, and because we don't need that, we're in better shape. But we've still doubled the size of our code base. We've still doubled the size of our code base. We need these two giant tables and this additional UDF. Right? So at the end of the day, they haven't given us really much of a factor around controlling technical debt, right? So, what abstraction is the one that we want, right? What would give us our dry principles? But well, here's what it would be if we could define a variable like this, right? Table of these four columns, that's what the merchant client and the service client is. It is a table of these four columns. And if we can define a variable that represents a table of these four columns, we can return the table of these columns out of this and then pass it into this. And then we wouldn't need EU client accounts, Canadian client accounts, we just have one client accounts table. Okay? This would be the result of our refactor. This would remain the same, only this would need to be changed. So here's how we would do it, right? This one, we would pass the union of these two into this one the union of these two into this one, right? That would, be, that would be our abstraction. The fact that we can pass an actual table into a UDF, and then in there, in there, we do more stuff to that table, right? And this is the controllable technical debt. This is where we have a controllable feature set. Well, the problem is there is no database that can do this. Because to do this, you need a polymorphic type system. And databases do not have polymorphic type systems. Okay? An even more interesting idea is what if we could define a class? Not just table of four columns, but a table of a class that represents a record type. This is the record type of this particular table, right? That is even more interesting because then you could say, this returns table of this record type. This takes table of this record type. We just have unions of things that have this table of this record type. And this works out in the type system, right? This makes sense. If you have a table and a table of the same columns, it's effectively the same record type. So you know you can take a union of them. So at this point, everybody says, what? Object-oriented programming in databases? What? This is ORM, right? This is Hibernate, right? This is what Hibernate does. Let's use Hibernate. <sighs> let's use Hibernate. All right, let's, uh, let's make a client. That's our super class of our merchant and service clients. Let's have our JPQL queries that get them like this. And then we need our other, oh, by the way, speaking of which, well, here's our union. How do you make a union of two JPQL queries? Well, you can't. You use a for loop. That's a union of two JPQL queries. Anyway, here's the other part of it, right? Well, here are all of the other tables that we need to do our magic, and we have JPQL for all of them. And we put them all together in some horrific structure that looks like this. Okay? So we've, we've taken everything, we've loaded it up into our, into our tables, and then this happens. <laughs> right? Uh, this, is, this is a problem that has never actually been resolved by Hibernate. Right? Because when we start grabbing all of our tables and grabbing all of our schemas and walking into our object class hierarchy, we start and we end up having to execute tons and tons and tons of queries to load that object hierarchy into memory. It's a great paper by Philip Wadler, the sort of the godfather of Haskell and a lot of functional programming, where he says, look, 
going from some language like Java, for instance, or Ruby or C or you know anything, is a little bit like the Silica Ribbonist mythos, where the two problems you could run into is having to execute lots and lots of queries. That's the first one. A little bit like a whirlpool. And this is a very good metaphor because round and round and round we goes when we stop, so nobody knows. Right? <laughs> you get stuck in here. So, um, and they found out that this is a very systemic problem when they started creating databases that query XPath, right? XPath is very similar to an object hierarchy. It has nested hierarchical structures. And as you're traversing those nested hierarchical structures, you have to execute more and more and more queries as you layer through. And the fact they found that the best that they could possibly do in this kind of system is to have another query for each particular sublayer. And in many cases, they need a query for every single entity. And this is a problem that's intrinsic to the fact right, that when you have object hierarchies, they have arrays and maps that point forward. Right? You have an array, you are pointing to everybody that you are associated with. Right? Databases point backward. Right? Things have IDs that point to you. And navigating these two different paradigms requires lots and lots of queries. So this is very systemic to the domain. This is, <laughs> right? this is, this is ultimately where we get. You cannot cross this sort of bridge of these two paradigms without significant cost. The other problem, of course, that you can get into is that, and in JPQL you get a lot of that, or, you know, stop, do not pass go, do not collect 500 or whatnot, right? You can actually fail to generate a valid query. Sometimes the JPQL just generates garbage, and your database just spits it out saying, oh, right? And then sometimes, sometimes, when you're trying to make your JPQL query, you end up creating this tree of syntax that's supposed to compile to SQL and that just can't, so high rate blows up internally. Um, so Philip Wadler, who wrote this paper, essentially um, came up with a bunch of steps that he can use, or that anybody can use, to actually be able to navigate this path. And they call him Lambda Man now, because you know, he wears a cape to functional programming conferences. But uh, the problem with this system is that it does not include the full feature set of SQL. Things like distinct are not part of it, so you have to improvise. And when you improvise, this happens. A big problem with language integrated query frameworks is you end up producing queries that you don't know you would have produced, and you end up blowing your database, and your DBAs hate you. And you Right, this is a legitimate question, right? What are you going to execute in the future on my database so that I can create the indexes and make sure that it does not blow up? Right? Especially if I'm client-facing and I have SLAs, right? This is this is very legitimate. So what if you could do all of this during compile time? What if you could cross this straight in the compiler itself? Well, how do you do that, right? You start with some higher level language. What you need is a macro engine, right? Because you have some, something in your higher level language that ultimately needs to get translated into SQL code. You need a macro system. Java doesn't have one, unfortunately. Not too many languages have one. Scala has one. This macro engine, quote unquote, is the thing that you need to actually be able to write the code that will translate into SQL, and ideally, actually execute the code inside of your compiler on the database. And by the time your code comes out of your compiler, you know whether it worked or not. That's what you saw up there in the first slide. The query failed inside of the compiler. Right? And then you take the code that's coming out of your compile log, you go to your DBA team and you say, here, this is what I will execute. What is this language integrated query? Right? What is it? Is it this? Well, it's not this, because this is a bunch of duct tape that leads to this. Okay? Actually, it's this. It's functional programming. Wait, what? What? what what's that? What's functional programming? What, what does that have to do with anything? So, well, let's see. In functional programming, you have 
languages that have object hierarchies, deeply nested object hierarchies. Here are people that have addresses. A person has a list of addresses. Okay. All right. What is this funny little operator called flat? Right? Flat map is an operator that just goes inside of your sublist and just pulls it out. Right? So here we're pulling out the name of the person and the street. Right? So here we go. Here's the result of this. Right? So we go into people, we go into addresses, and for each one we add, we create a list of the names and the name of the last name. That list has a single tuple inside. You can concatenate everything out, and here's what you get. Right? And the nice thing about this thing is that you can keep going with it. Oh, by the way, here's right, here's what that would be. Right? This is a this is a two-level, this is like a two-level right? But you can keep going. Imagine that the addresses have apartment units, right? And they have tenants, etc. You could keep going. Imagine that your apartment units have a list of furniture inside them, right? And you want to pull some information out of that. Now let's add some filters. Right? So you want to get all of, your, all of your landlords that have unoccupied units with red couches in them. You know, because these are pre-furnished units. Right? So here, here is how you walk into the whole object hierarchy, selectively filter out parts of it, and then return your results. This is what you would have down here. Now this is starting to get a little confusing, right? Too many levels of nesting here, right? And, you know, and some people are like, no, no, you know, this is what we want, right? This is very clear. Well, there was a lot of argument back and forth, and then Java 8 eventually capitulated and said, no, 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 the Scala people have the right idea. This is what we need, right? But here's the thing. The thrust behind the original statement of we want some kind of language construct to do stuff like this and make it easier on the eyes that was a good thought. So unfortunately, in Java, we don't have this. In Scala, we do. Right? This is this. Right? You just take this thing, you unroll it into a series of these. This map operator is the last one that takes everything out and immediately wraps it back up in the final list. Right? If you have this kind of construct, right, this is very easy on the eyes. You know? Just walk into your object hierarchy and pull out what you need. Now let's add some filters. This is starting to look like a query. A lot like a query. Almost exactly like a query. Right? Interesting. This is, this is a, an analog right here. So here's the result set, right? Same result set. Walk into your object hierarchy, pull everything out. You are effectively querying your object hierarchy and pulling out tuples that contain these fields. Here's where it gets interesting. What if you don't want to return just individual columns? What if you want to return whole objects? I want to return the entire person, the entire address. I don't care about the columns inside yet. I just want to pull out the whole thing. Well, guess what? Each record type is going to consist of a row, of a person, and an address. Each row is these two. Sorry, the variable naming isn't perfect, mm -hmm. right? But um, you know, I do have to fit it on slide, right? But if you can have this kind of paradigm, this, this is the combination, this is the unison of the SQL paradigm and the object paradigm. This is it right here. These funny looking four yield mappy flat mappy things, right? This is what unites SQL and the object paradigm. And these four yield funny mappy flat mappy things have a scary name. <clears throat> this is a very scary name, right? Because it comes from math and everything from math, they, they love to make scary sounding names, right? But that's, that's what this is. You have maps and flat maps, you take them, you have this nice little way of constructing them into one single understandable expression, 
which is effectively a query. So, um, let's, what are we doing here? Uh, oh, yes. So, you know, this is a, another little syntax element. You can just take this thing and express it on multiple lines. Okay. Um, so let's see what we can do with this, right? We start with a simple query, right? Simple query of person, right? We just pull out all of our fields of the person, and then we reconstitute it again into a tuple, right? This happens during runtime. Just take the row and reconstitute it. You can do that in each row. Okay, let's do some more interesting things, like let's make a union with something else and return that. Well, look at that. Again, these are query of persons, so you can make a union between them. There's a query down here. Let's do something more complicated. Let's take the result of this, and let's pass it into a function that then joins another table onto it, and voila. This is the essence of query composition. What is a join? A join is where you have a row that has a record type. You do this magical thing with this other table, and you get a record type that has both kinds of things in it. So you have record of person, then you have record of address, and then you take them and you make record of person and address. Well, there it is. Unfortunately, um, this is... Uh, this is a little bit too pretty to be reality. <laughs> reality is a little bit more like this, where you have this funny little quoted thing here. And the reason for this is the following. Remember this? You take a bunch of code, you quote it, or put it into a quotation. And once you put it into a quotation, you can say, everything inside this quotation is SQL. So then you pass that into your macro engine, your quotations, i.e. everything inside of here, and here, and here, and this thing spits out our SQL. This is the key of how such a system can be constructed. Here's our final query, right? And our variable names aren't that good. We can work on that. But the thing here is that, look, we, we have this whole nested hierarchical thing that we've passed into something, into something, into something. And then we've taken it, we pull the whole thing out, and take a look. Right here, we have our person address, person address. This is an implicit join. Um, we also have syntaxes for explicit joins, etc. Remember the thing that we wanted in the beginning? The ability to be able to take things out of UDFs and put it back into UDFs? Well, this is it right here. Right? This is this. This is the same darn thing. You take stuff, you pull it out, you put it into things. You pull it out of those things, you put it into things. You pull it out of those things, you pull it into these things. Voila. This is what the Quill framework is all about. And the abstraction is this funny little query of T. So let's take a look at how this thing works, right? You have this thing over here, right? You return objects from your query. Again, pretty similar. What about this thing right here? Also query of client, which is why you can make a union. Let's take a look at these two, right? Okay, so we have some differences. One of them has a market code. The other one has a partnership code that comes from a join table. They're both filtered by this registry thing. And then we have some other things that, you know, certain things need to get propagated from other things. So there are differences. Let's abstract them out. Okay. Well, here's something interesting. This registry table that we joined onto is just a glorified filter. So all we need to do is we need to say anything that has an alias column, that's what this thing here is, it's a duck type, anything that has an alias column, what is the contract on a join? Remember how in SQL I said you cannot abstract out a join? We are abstracting out a join right here. And the contract type is that one column. You have an alias column, you can be joined to a registry. You can be joined to a registry, and then we just return the original thing out. Right? We start with T, we end with T. Here's an example. Right? We start with foo. We end with foo. In the middle we 
do a join, and this is what comes out. Um, okay, what else do we need? We need, uh, we need a code that comes from a partnership. Same strategy. Join it up, return something out. In this case, what's interesting is that we end up having, this is how we use it, by the way, so we take something here, pass it into this join thing here, and eventually out here we have a query. Right? Think about adding a filter. What happens if you add a filter in here? Do, 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 do. Right? You add a filter up here, the kind of row that comes out doesn't change, which means you can still pass it into here. Right? So this just controls the filter that happens here. <laughs> okay. Oh, here is what comes out of that. Right? I've got some subliminal messaging in there. Right? And here's the thing. What happens? You have a query of an actual object and a character type. This is what that turns into. So you can actually mix record types of objects and columns or single fields. Right? That's the way query composition works. Anything can be inside that row. Okay, so let's take these two, right? And let's put them together. Well, we're almost there. Not quite, because we need to make a client object, right? It needs to be query of client. Okay, okay, there's, there's your query. So what do we need? Ah! Notice how the result of those flat mappy mappy things was always a map at the end. So we just had this, right? And we everything, all of our ingredients to make our client row are here. We just need to do that final thing. Well, there it is right there. And then we're done. Here's our query that comes out. Here is here's the result. Right? Here's service clients. There are all the results that come out. Notice this blue here and this blue here. Wait a minute. Merchant clients needed to filter by registry too, right? We needed that filter in both places. Ooh, let's abstract that out. <coughs> Again, filter by registry. So essentially, this is how you start abstracting out pieces of SQL code. Because at the end of the day, this and this is what it reduces to. You don't have giant queries anymore. You never have giant queries because you have actually abstracted out all the common parts. Well, there's our clients, right? This is a union operator. Um, again, the types allow us to do this. It's because we have something of this, something of this, something of this. That's why we can take the union of these. And here are the results we've previously concatenated. Okay. And there's our final query. Right? We had all of our joins that need to happen between the clients, registry, partnerships, all the joins that needed to happen in both places. They're all here. Oh, but we had all these new complex requirements that we needed to do. <coughs> okay, okay, let's see. Let's take this thing. Oh, all we need is a market inside. Okay, fine. That was just a UDF. What about this case? What about this case, right? We had some additional joins that needed to happen there. Let's step back a second, right? This is what we had. We had the object and another character. What happens if we, oh, and we did this up here, right? We called this, which was here. What happens if we just pull out the whole table that we just joined? Right? The join is a superset of everything inside. What happens when we just pull the table, the whole table out? Well, here's what happens. Right? We could just take this thing here. Let's highlight it in blue. And look at that. We've taken this thing, we've joined it to some other stuff, and then we join up the next table, and there's our European service clients table. Ah, but wait a minute. Sorry, first of all, here are the types, right? Again, this is the join table. Record type of the join table, that's what these fours are. You just take everything, deconstruct it into records, and then put it back together down here. Let's do us one better. Let's pull this up into its own function. We abstract this whole thing out into its own function, and then call it down here. What does that give us? Well, we could just have our original service clients that we had way before we started, and we've refactored that to use this. 
So this is, this is the process that we keep on going through. We refactor, abstract out, refactor, abstract out, refactor, abstract out. You never get into SQL hell this way. This is how you manage thousands of SQL queries. You just abstract out the common parts. Okay, again, the types are what allow us to do this. So here, here, is, here are our final pieces, right? We have these requirements. We do not have these requirements anymore. And here, let's tighten them up. We can put them all in one line. And here are the SQL queries that came out. Right? Very, very large amount of stuff we've done here in a relatively small surface area. Right? This is the point. These are our thousands of SQL queries that we can manage now. What about the rest of this query? What about a whole bunch of other stuff that we need to do? Well, like every good series that wants a second season to be continued. Or if you want, you just go to this page on GitHub and everything's done. But that's it. Thank you, everyone.